Hello, uh, my name is Tisana. I'm senior researcher at CRC Georgia, and today's topic is reliability of data. Um, we're going to split this uh, discussion into two. First of all, we'll talk about what questions to ask about data before using it for anything, and uh, second part, we'll concentrate on uh, how what things to be uh, careful about when interpreting the data. Um, on the screen we have questions uh, that you should ask about any data you are um, planning to use. Uh, first of all, you should always ask questions about what is the source of the data, uh, where is it coming from. If you cannot find the source of the data, you can forget about using the data for anything. Uh, what things to look for in sources? Is it uh, the organization that carried out the research that is giving away the data? Uh, is it a second party who uh, has already processed the data and you are using secondary data already analyzed and interpreted? It's very important to know where is the data coming from. Is it first source, second source, and if you can trace it back to the origins. Uh, second question is about where is the funding coming from. This might be a tricky uh, subject because sometimes you cannot always find out um, where the funding for the research came from. Uh, but most of the time, uh, because of the transparency uh, regulations, uh, all the organizations who are, uh, have public data have also uh, a responsibility to spread about information about funding. Uh, for example, some, uh, CRC Georgia always puts uh, on its webpage information about uh, from what project is the data coming from, where is the funding coming from, and sometimes some financial schemes are complicated. For example, uh, for NDI surveys, we get actual money from UK aid, uh, which gives money to NDI, and NDI uh, gives us this money to do some surveys and focus groups and etc. So it's very important to know where is the money coming from because most of the time, uh, whoever is funding, uh, their interests are, are expressed in the data. So it's important to know who conducted the survey and why, or whatever kind of research it was. Uh, the third question is uh, when the data was generated. That's also a very important issue uh, because uh, let's concentrate on surveys. Uh, sometimes a survey is conducted, for example, about people's attitudes towards um, visa liberalization or European Union and Georgia's membership into the uh, European Union and after the survey is conducted that something important happens. For example, somebody says something very bad about Georgia from European Union and that might shift people's opinion drastically and because you have already conducted the survey and people's opinion may have shifted after that, it's really important to know when was the survey conducted in order to understand why, for example, certain opinions might be contradictory or not representing current reality. Uh, data is always attached to the reality in time, so it's really important to know where the data was written and when. Also, it's very important to know um, about the purpose of data collection. Um, when we talk about surveys, most of the time people uh, think of political opinion polls, and especially it's a very uh, popular subject around election times, and uh, sometimes people think that surveys are designed to predict, for example, election uh, results and uh, they try to interpret the data of, for example, party support or uh, people saying who they will vote for as a uh, prediction for uh, future vote, as, a, as election results. And that's not right because if the, uh, if the survey was not designed to predict election results, it will not be appropriate measure for what the election results will be in the future. So it's very important to know what were the objectives of whoever funded and whoever carried out the research. It's really important to know why they wanted, why they asked certain questions or why they used a certain methodology. So it's important to know what was the main purpose of the research because it would have inevitably influenced the research instrument and therefore the data. Also it's very important and people rarely pay attention to this, how was the sampling done? Uh, most of the time we do research on a small amount of people or uh, when content analysis, a small amount of uh, media content because it's impossible to do research on everybody or on all the media, media content. Uh, that's why we sample. And uh, how we sample, how we do the sampling part, is very important um, in terms of how representative the data will be. For example, it is um, 
uh, very popular to, for example, interview people at the public uh, I don't know, places, for example, near metro station or near bus stops. Um, that's a very bad way of sampling because not everybody has to pass by these public spaces. For example, pensioners are most of the time at home or people who only drive cars and never walk will never come along these public spaces and have no chance of being interviewed. So it's really important to have information about how the sampling was done. If it was a random sampling, and this is a huge subject, but in general if you have access to information how sampling was done, you can look into it and understand if it's representative sample and you can use the data to talk about a bigger group uh, rather than just sample. Um, then you can rely on that data. But if you cannot find information on how sampling was done, it's really suspicious and you should be uh, very cautious when using this data. For example, it's not uh, unacceptable to do surveys near metro stations, but you cannot talk about whole Georgian population. You can only talk about people who seem like who are around metro stations during those hours that you did the survey. So it's really important to think about that too. And another thing is weighting of the data. Um, no uh, sample is ideal. Uh, the ideal sample is to have exact representation of the population in the sample. For example, if we have 50% men and 50% women in the sample, we want the same, right? But sometimes it happens that, uh, for example, in most surveys, CRC Georgia has 65% women interviewed and 35% uh, uh, men interviewed. Uh, we need to do some corrections to have this um, sample corrected. Uh, we need our sample to be uh, a little picture of a bigger population and that's why weighting uh, is done on the data and you should always ask questions about uh, and look for the information if the data you are planning to use is weighted. If it's not weighted then it's likely that it's not representative of the whole population and unweighted data you can only use to talk about the sample, not the population. That's also a very important thing and uh, sometimes organizations don't always put uh, public information about this and uh, you just have to ask for it. I'm going to show an example of um, uh, what kind of information uh, you should look for when you're looking for uh, data. Um, on the screen you can see this is from Caucasus Barometer 2017, this is fact sheet and this is the basic information you need to know before you use the data. Here we have the dates when the survey was conducted, how many people were interviewed, what, what was the response rates, what languages were the interviews conducted. And a uh, very important thing is that uh, there's a contact information for a person who can give you answers um, on more questions about methodology and, for example, how certain things were done and how question was developed or if there were any problems during the fieldwork, etc. So it's really important to, for each uh, data to look for this kind of information and uh, know where it's coming from, when it was conducted, if the sampling was done in a proper way, if the weighting was done, and if you can contact somebody to have further information on all of these issues. Uh, so this is part of how you should check uh, if the data is reliable or not, not before using it. And I'm going to move to the second part where uh, we'll, tell, we'll speak more, more about uh, how to, uh, even if the data is reliable, you may make some mistakes in interpreting the data that will affect uh, reliability of whatever you will say based on this data. The first most important thing is validity of data. Uh, sometimes you have very good reliable data and reliable means that you have, will have the same results if you, if you do the same survey over and over again. But validity is more about if you are really measuring uh, what you are saying you are measuring, if you are really uh, talking about a thing or a variable that you want to talk about. And a um, very simple example is if you do an IQ test, uh, which is variable and which is, which is in English, uh, it is really hard to tell if you are measuring uh, language skills or IQ because, for example, I'm not a native English speaker and for me, I may not know all the words in English that are included in the text and you may not be able to tell what my real IQ is, you will more likely be telling what my language ability is. So it's really important to know on specific questions and specific items what are they really measuring and not to interpret it in another way. Always think about validity. Are you really measuring and is this variable really measuring whatever it is 
saying it is measuring. And sometimes even the organizations can make mistakes and sometimes it's a, a subject of discussion if a certain question, for example, question about performance of ministries uh, is measuring trust, overall attitude, or it's just assessment of uh, performance, or if it's assessment of liking a certain person who is representing this ministry or something like that. So it's uh, quite often a subject of discussion. And it's important to think about it when you are interpreting and spreading the data, how you phrase it. Another important thing is to look at, uh, if you have raw data in your hands, to look at uh, percentages, proportions and not numbers. For example, on the screen you can see on the left side uh, frequencies and uh, this is just a simple question. Do you, does your household uh, own a car? And you have two groups, Georgian settlements and minority settlements. If you only look at the frequencies, it seems like that the ratio is one to three. Like Georgians seem to own cars much more often than minorities. But if you look at the proportions, you can see that it's 50-50. Half of Georgian settlements have cars and half of minority settlements have cars. Which means that uh, the interviewed, um, we interviewed much more Georgians and interviewed much, more minor, much, much less minorities because the proportion in overall population is like that. And if you only look at the frequencies, you will make wrong, dis uh, wrong assumptions about uh, Georgians having more cars. Which is not right because if you look at the proportions, Georgians and minorities are as much likely to have car or not have the car. So it's really important not to look at the frequencies. For example, sometimes you can. Like, if you are comparing how much grape is produced in Georgia compared to how much grape is produced in China, and you think about uh, how small Georgia is and how big China is, like, you may have the same territory, but it will maybe all of Georgia and only a tiny part of China. So it's really important to think about proportions and sizes in interpreting the data. Uh, another uh, very important thing uh, also is um, most of the times, so we are not only interested in one variable, we are interested in how two variables interact. For example, uh, we want to know about gender differences or we want to know about uh, age differences in certain, on certain issues. For example, if you think about if Georgia is democracy or not, uh, it's interesting to see, for example, if Georgians think that uh, Georgia is democracy today more than, for example, minority settlements or some different demographic groups, right? Uh, when, think about, uh, when, when we think about comparing groups, it's very important to think about size of the groups. Um, sometimes, for example, we have online data analysis tool and we are always afraid that people will use it without, uh, wrongly without knowing they are using it wrong. Uh, because, for example, I personally think that education is related to attitudes towards democracy strongly. And, uh, but I never can make that interpretation because, for example, my hypothesis can be that people with PhD are more likely to think, um, to like democratic regime uh, than people with, for example, secondary technical education, right? But uh, if I only interview 20 people who have PhDs and I have much more people, for example, 200, 300 people with secondary technical education, this means I cannot compare these groups. Because 20 people is too few, uh, you cannot, uh, they cannot be representative of all the people in Georgia who have PhD degree. Even though they are fewer than people with secondary technical education, 20 people is not enough to have representative data. And you cannot compare 20 people to 200 people. For example, let's look at this next slide. On this slide you can see that uh, we are comparing people's attitudes towards democracy, if Georgia is democracy or not, uh, according to their primary activity, if they are pensioners or students or housewives or retired people. On this slide you can see that, for example, disabled people are most likely to think that Georgia is democracy, right? And if we go across we see that students also are more likely to think that Georgia is democracy and retired people who are looking for a job uh, think less of Georgia as being democracy. Uh, our interpretations based on this slide would be very biased because of the next slide. Uh, this is simple frequency of how this uh, primary activity is distributed in Georgian population and you can see that the group, for example, this group uh, retired and looking for a job, it's only 1%. It's too tiny. You cannot make generalizable assumptions based on this 
small number of people. So it's really important when you have the data to look at the size of the groups that you are comparing. You cannot compare this um, uh, apple to I don't know whole wine yard. It's really important to have uh, comparable sizes of the groups. Uh, also, very very important uh, thing when interpreting the data is um, to remember that correlation is not causation, and that's the most common mistakes. Not only uh, people who are not familiar with data analysis make, but also people who do it on an everyday basis, they also make this mistake. Uh, this is a funny example. For example, people who like ice cream may also like uh, summer more than people who don't like ice cream. But this in no way means that people like ice cream because they like summer or they like summer because they like ice cream. Uh, some things are just correlated, maybe because uh, there's something behind it, another third variable which is influencing both of them, or there's maybe no correlation, uh, no causation at all. But it's important to know that because some things change together, it doesn't mean they are causing each other. That's very important to know. As we are on causation, we are mentioning causation, it's really important to know that only uh, design that can give you um, a possibility to talk about causation is experimental design. That's when you control everything, uh, you manipulate with the variables, and then you can be sure that one thing caused another. Uh, no other research design can give you causation, so just simply forget about, uh, probably you will never uh, get the chance to talk about causation based on, for example, survey data or the data, secondary data you can obtain from other research organizations. So it's very important to know that uh, you can't really interpret causation based on survey data or correlation data. And the last point, which is also very, very important, especially when talking about uh, quantitative data um, coming from survey data, which is most widespread <laughs> right now in Georgia. Um, surveys are basically a representation of people's perceptions. And what people say doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. Uh, you should always think about how the data is obtained and what data in reality is and not, uh, not uh, to try to say it's a uh, objective reality. For example, if people say that Georgia is not democracy, it doesn't really mean that it's not democracy. Or if people say that uh, they don't like a certain person, it doesn't mean that person is bad. You should always know how the questions were asked, what the order of the questions was, or um, what kind of um, variable they were actually measuring before interpreting it. And this is very common because sometimes they take one question and say, okay, this is represented just because people say that uh, jobs and employment is the most important issue, it doesn't mean that nobody's doing anything about that and uh, it, it is the most important issue. Maybe education is the most important issue objectively, but it's the, just the perception of people, not to expect too much from the data. Um, you should always know that if you ask people and you take uh, down information from people, it's just their representation of the real world, not objective world, and not to, uh, for example, not to try to compare the results of the question on whether Georgia is democracy or not, not to compare it to uh, objective indexes of democracy uh, and how we are ranking it uh, according to it uh, compared to other worlds, uh, other parts of the world and other countries. So that's also very important. Uh, basically, this is what I wanted to say today about uh, reliability of data and um, what to be cautious of when you're interpreting the data. Stay tuned for future videos.